Well, as we turn to Romans 13, we get into some of the most difficult to teach dogmatically section of Scripture. Like the culture is so different. Paul is writing to people who probably at least half are not even Roman citizens and don't have the ability to become Roman citizens. And we have, especially if you include limitations on women, on servants and slaves, like the, the amount of people that actually were considered citizens by Rome is so low. We live in a world where, where our governing authorities acknowledge the rights of the individual because their, their power is based on the power of the common person. And of course, you know, we all have whatever opinion about how faithfully our governing authorities may or may not um, adhere to that. But still, our system of government here in America, it begins with the rights of the individual. That certainly was not true in Rome. In Rome, you have a Caesar who not only rules, you know, without question, but rules with divinity, says, no, Caesar is the son of the gods and rules without question, has, has armies at his disposal, um, it's, uh, and, and sees his people as people that he has conquered and that he uh, rules over, not as fellow citizens. So let's start with that and then dig into Romans 13 and also understand, and I hope you've read it. Don't listen to me until you've read Romans 13, made some notes in your Bible on your own. But, um, but let's remember that we're in a section of Romans where Paul has turned the page and is talking practically about how to live life in light of the first section, which was so theological. So let's not read this and say, you know, when Paul says, um, you know, the wages of sin is death, that is all time, always, that's always going to be true. When Paul's talking about these ethical things, he's actually saying in your situation, you're going to have to apply these once and for all truths in a myriad of situations. And as he's writing to this particular culture in this particular moment, we get to listen in and see what his practical advice was to these Christians in Rome. And then it's our job to say, okay, not how do I feel about this, but rather what part of this is once and for all, all time? What part of this is just for them in Rome? How do I apply this in my life? How do I apply this in my culture? This is difficult work and it takes humility and it takes really leaning in to the theological truth that Paul has taught us so far in this book so we can see how he's working them out in his culture so then we can work them out in our culture too. So the the chapter starts and this, this video might be a little long. I just kind of like to read the passage and make a couple of of notes along the way, but I'll try to do it quickly. For every person, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. The amount of categories that are not present here is striking to me. Not if you're a citizen, not if you're Jewish, not if you're Greek, not if you have a certain education, not what gender you are. No, Paul says, look, everybody needs to be subject to the governing authorities. And again, we're talking about most probably Nero being the, the uh, Caesar at the time. We're not talking about good governing authorities. We're talking about oppressive, um, conquering. Uh, the, the Roman Empire was debauched and corrupt. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Well, okay, so in what sense can Paul look at Nero and go, Nero's God's man. The idea that authority comes from God is, is the idea, you might think of it like, like energy coming from the sun. And I know there's some things on the bottom of the ocean that take their energy from the warmth of the earth or whatever. But just for the sake of argument, say every living thing gets its energy from the sun. Well, some people are going to, you know, where the energy comes to plants and then animals eat it and we eat them and we eat the plants and whatever. And that's what gives us energy that we can go out and do things. And you say, well, some people are cruel with their energy. Some people are consuming uh, calories and getting energy, and then what they're doing with that is, is unconscionable. They're mean, evil people. Other people are taking the energy that they uh, consume, and they're doing wonderful and good things with it. And yet we would say all of it comes from the sun. In the same way, Paul is saying, look, understand that the people in authority are going to have to answer for the way they are using the authority that they have. But Paul 
is less making a point about the grandeur of human authority and more making a point of, hey, these guys think they rule without question, but no, rather, it comes from God. They are subject to God, whether they know it or not. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities re resists what God has appointed. And that's difficult. Yeah, in some sense, God has allowed, appointed this, uh, this to happen. I, I think of uh, the old saying, you know, you always have the government you deserve. I don't know if that's applied here or not. And those who resist will incur judgment. Paul is speaking so practically. He's saying, look, if you act a fool, you're going to go to jail. Like, hey, guys, I love just the practical nature of this. Keep on reading. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but, uh, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Paul is saying, look, I think he's speaking especially to people who would see the gospel as a call to start a political rebellion. He says, look, that the the institution of the kingdom of God has already happened. The tomb is empty. It is not for us to take up arms and go storm the castle. Rather, it is for us to live the kind of lives. Here is our rebellion, that we live faithful lives no matter what the government is doing, no matter what the authorities are doing. And then practically, he's saying, look, um, most of the time, if you act well, you'll do good. You know, if you do good, you'll, you'll be well. We have to say, is this totally once and for all, all the time? Well, we're worshiping a savior who was arrested by Rome, was crucified on a Roman cross at the hands of Pontius Pilate. I don't think Paul is saying, if you obey the law, it will always go well with you and the government is always going to be on your side. No, certainly that wasn't true in Paul's life. It wasn't true in Jesus' life. And yet as he teaches people and gives advice to his church, he says, it's best if we Christians are law-abiding citizens. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but for the sake of conscience. For because of you, uh, because of this, you also pay taxes. Man, wouldn't this be a different discussion if this passage wasn't in the, scrap, uh, in the scriptures? Paul says, look, we pay taxes attending this very thing. We pay to all who is owed to them, taxes to whom they are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whose honor is owed. Paul is saying, look, being a part of the kingdom of God does not remove you from the kingdom of earth and all the rules. We, we don't write the IRS a, uh, a note every um, year and just go, hey, I'm a Christian, so you're not the boss of me. No, Paul says, look, exist as a faithful, good citizen in the land where you are. In my context, that's America. Yours might be someplace else. And Paul would say, even to this oppressive Roman church who's reading this, and probably would love it if Paul goes, we are a new nation in Christ, and so forget Rome. Let's pick up arms and go win a battle, and God will be with us. But instead of that, he says, look, we need to act differently. We need to live differently. But we need to act in accordance with the laws of uh of our culture. And I think, I, I, you know, this is de of devotion, so I won't teach the whole thing, but I think that if you read Paul, he would probably say the exception of that is if they tell you to stop telling the story of Jesus, that that is the hill we die on. That is the, uh, as, as laws get stringent, we say, all right, we're going to submit to the authorities and understand. I also think that, that you can't take this uh, discussion away from suffering for Christ. We are going to suffer for righteousness sake. Look, and sometimes it's going to be the laws that cause us to suffer. Well, Christians don't go, I don't like this. I'm, you know, sticking it to the man. No, rather we say, okay, I am still going to be a worshiper of Jesus. And if, the, if the, the world gets more difficult to do that, it won't change the fact that I'm doing that. And there might be some suffering involved, but I'm willing to do that. Christians should be the best scientists because we believe in a God of order. Christians should be the best citizens because we see the church as the gift to the world and that our hope is not to establish a political reality. Our hope is to um, see the kingdom of God spread through every nation on earth, including the one we love that we, um, that we belong to. So just really quickly, um, look at the second half of this this chapter, which is maybe a little easier to apply and gets more to the heart of the heart of the, the message. 
Owe no one to anything except love each, except to love each other. And don't get indebted, don't call in favors, just love people. This is Paul's advice. Yes, the world's doing all this stuff. For us, the only thing we owe to each other is love. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. All right, you're thinking he's talking to his Jewish friends again. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Maybe even here Paul is buffeting this, hey, um, be subject to authorities, but only insofar as you're still allowed to love your neighbor. Because this you know, uh, because this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. So for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone and the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly. Man, don't you love that, that after all of the theology of the first two-thirds of Romans, Paul says it boils down to this. Love your neighbor as yourself and walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness and in sexual immorality and sensuality and not quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. You know, the problem with that rebellious, like the government's the problem and I'm going to fight them. The, the problem with that is that many times it is self-centered. It is me that wants that rebellion, that fight. So Paul says, be subject to the authorities, but here's the revolution. Are you a revolutionary? Man, you need to be a revolutionary. Jesus was a revolutionary, but not a political revolutionary, rather a revolutionary of the soul, of the person who would die to self and live for him. So Paul says, you, you want to be punk rock? Man, I, I, I want to be punk rock. You want to be punk rock? Well, here's how you do it. You die to yourself. It, it's not about fighting the authorities. Rather, it's about fighting the desire to sin in us. Put to death what is earthly. Right? Don't participate in all the sin of the culture. That's what, that's what you rebel from. You rebel from the sin of the culture. And instead, put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Let's be a blessing to our country. Let's be a blessing to each other. Put on Christ. All right. We love that. Out.